Yes. So my name is Fredrik Karlsson. I'm a professor in economics. And I primarily work in what you would call behavioral economics, applied to social issues such as uh, uh, environmental consumption, uh, uh, use of uh, antibiotics, etc. So I'm, I'm very interested in understanding why people do as they do and how we can affect people in different ways. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is economics of antibiotic resistance. And I'm going to do it in a, in a fairly broad manner. So, so I've, I've heard that you have a number of very specific questions. We'll try to handle those specific questions as well. And this is these four things is basically what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about introducing antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance as a social science problem. And I'm going to call it a collective action problem. Then I'm going to talk very briefly about the economic costs of antibiotic resistance. And then I'll go through a number of sort of factors that we know uh, affect the use of antibiotics and, and the development of, of antibiotic resistance. And finally, I'll talk about, I call it solutions, but it's definitely not solutions in terms of a new drug. It's more solutions in terms of policies to, to affect the use of antibiotics. I, before I define what a collective action problem is, I want to put up these three important facts uh, uh, on the board. The first is, is the fact that it's, it's quite easy to, to, to uh, uh, forget that antibiotics is, is really good. It's something that society needs. So, so there's a reason for why you want to use antibiotics. Second, and you guys should know all about this now, is that the use of antibiotics increases the likelihood of development of antibiotic resistance. And antibiotic resistance in itself is a bad. That's nothing good with that, okay? Now, a collective action problem or a tragedy of the commons problem is the fact that people, when they decide whether they want to use antibiotics or not, are basically going to compare the benefits and costs for themselves. Okay, what, what is the, the cost of being sick? What's the cost of taking antibiotics for myself? What are the benefits? People will make a judgment based on, on, on an evaluation of that. They would not tend to, to any great extent, take into consideration what would happen with society, what would happen with other people. And because they, in, under most normal circumstances, would not take that as into consideration, they will tend to use too much antibiotics from a social point of view. And that is what we call a, a tragedy of the commons or a collective uh, action, action problem. So the level of use of antibiotics in the society where we wouldn't regulate the use of antibiotics would be too high. And it would be too much antibiotic resistance in society. This is also something that we sometimes, now we use that word from time to time, sometimes we call it a negative externality. So an action of one single individual affects other people's uh, lives in, in, in negative ways, and there is no agreement on, on this effect. So the classical examples here would be environmental pollution. I drive my car, and when I'm driving my car, there is local air pollution effects that affect people, and there are small effects in terms of global warming that could affect the whole planet. That would be a negative externality. And for me as an economist, I see the use of antibiotics in the same manner. That using antibiotics resistance is a sorry using antibiotics is a negative externality because it's the increased likelihood of, of antibiotic resistance. And just as we have negative externalities, we could also think of that we have positive externalities. And maybe the best example there is, is vaccination. If I vaccinate myself, I not only increase decrease the likelihood that I get sick, I also decrease the likelihood that other people in, in society get sick. And I'll come back to to vaccination uh, as, as a solution later on. Now, in order to solve this problem, we need to take action, but we need to take action collectively, and that's why we call this a collective action problem. It's not sufficient that I stop driving my car to stop global warming. It's not sufficient that I stop taking antibiotics to stop the development of antibiotic resistance. We need to take actions in a joint manner. However, 
Once we have the case that we have people taking joint action together, there will always be incentives for individuals to what we call pre-write. So once we agree as a group, let's do this, there will always be incentives for each individual of this collective to not follow the rules, to break the law or, or to behave in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that is not in, uh, uh, as the way that we agreed upon. And we'll call that free riding. So each individual, even if you agree, each individual has incentives to use too much antibiotics. So collective action problems is then usually split into what we would call voluntary collective action problems, where we as individuals in society agrees on doing same things, and uh, collective action problems that are solved politically, where we actually institute rules and laws and regulations on what is allowed and what is not, not, uh, not allowed. And I'll talk about uh, uh, a number of examples of, of bo both these types. Now, as, 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 as I started, I'm a social scientist, right? So I'm, I'm not here to talk about how to develop new drugs, etc. I'm here to talk about this as a social science problem. And I think that social sciences has a number of things to, to help in, in when it comes to trying to solve or handle this problem. And first and foremost, if I look at my own research, it's about better understanding why people are doing what they're doing. And given that we know that, how can we then affect people to, for example, take less antibiotics or maybe even to prescribe less antibiotics? And in particular, and I'll focus on that, in particular, I think we have a lot to say about how to handle these collective action problems from a political point of view. What are the general rules and guidelines and, and maybe even taxes that we can implement in order to, to help us solve this this social problem. I also want to point out, and, and I, I understand that this is natural for all of you here in this room, but I want to point out that, that these collective action problems usually work at different levels. So we can talk about small scale local collective action problems. Think of a, 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 a lake where we have a tendency to take out too much fish, that would be a local problem and it would be fairly easy to handle that at a local level. There might be collective action problems that are a national problem. And then there are these ugly bastards that I call global or large scale collective action problems that basically involve the whole world. And antibiotic resistance is one, climate change is another one, biodiversity at the big scale is most likely another one, uh, uh, so ecosystem, etc. So there are a number of collective action social problems that are really large scale. And I want to point out maybe the fourth here on, on the slide here, but just let me just very quickly say the first ones. The first one is the obvious one. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of countries that are involved, if it's a global problem, which also means that each single individual has a very little impact on this thing. It doesn't really matter what I do as an individual. <laughs> and it also means that it's very difficult to monitor. But what makes antibiotic resistance a little bit different from many of the other large-scale collective action problems is that it is what we call a weakest link problem. And what I mean by that is that if we compare climate change, if 95% of the world's countries agreed on reducing their emissions drastically, we would most likely solve climate change and global warming. If 90-95% of the countries in the world agreed on drastic reducing the, the use of antibiotics, we would most likely not solve the problem of antibiotic resistance because resistance would spread from the countries that do not take action. So antibiotic resistance is actually a much more complicated problem from a social point of view than, 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 than climate change, because we need almost everybody to be on board. Of course, there would always be a, a threshold where it would be fine if it's just one single island in the world that doesn't do anything, right? But, but it, it means that it is a, it's a pretty particular problem. Now, having said that, I won't talk much about global uh, uh, arrangements for, for, for uh, handling uh, antibiotic resistance. Then let me, even briefer, just 
talk a little bit about the economic cost of antibiotic resistance. And I'm actually going to focus on a very particular thing. Um, and I want to do this just to, so that you get a sense of what, what would be the social costs uh, uh, for society if uh, uh, antibiotic resistance develops more than what it is today. And I'll talk about a, a, a RAND study that was done a few years ago called Estimating the Economic Costs of Antimicrobial Resistance. And the, the fun and the interesting thing about this study is that it really tries to look at the economic cost at a global level. And it focuses only on two things. Well, actually only on one thing. It actually focuses only on the stuff that we produce in the world. Okay? So it focuses on what we call labor supply. Because development of antibiotic resistance will mean that people will die sooner than later, and people will be sick more often. And those two things will have an effect on what we can produce in an economy. So this is very similar to when we estimate, say, the cost of climate change. Major effects of climate change will mean that we will have loss in agricultural production. We would have, have uh, to spend money protecting our, uh, our, our cities from flooding, etc. It would take away productive resources. And it's the same with this study. It's looking at what happens, the, sorry, the major effect of antibiotic resistance that they look at here is what is the effect on what we produce in the economy. So this means, of course, that there are a bunch of things that are not included in these numbers. And in particular, what is not included is sort of the suffering uh, 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 that people have from being sick more often, from that, that people actually die. And they look at, uh, uh, at five different regions in the world. So OECD, uh, uh, European Union, Latin America, those countries that are not the OECD, the MENA region, uh, Eurasia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And they look at, at first, the, the baseline. And the baseline, it, it, I mean, it, it's, we already know this is not true, but the baseline that, that is sort of it is today, which they call no resistance scenario. So they're, they're sort of assuming that there is no resistance today, which is not true. Then they look at a case where, OK, what happens if there is only a small increase in, 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 in the rate of resistance, uh, up to 5%? Then what they call a normal case, 40%, and then the worst case, 100%. What would be the cost of society for these three cases compared to the baseline? And again, mind you, in terms of loss of productive resources in the economy, that's all. And they look at, what is it? It's, well, they look at more than these years that I have here. Uh, they look at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, if I, if I don't remember completely wrong. Uh, these numbers that you, see, uh, that you see here are numbers compared to the baseline. Okay? What would be the reduction in production in these five different, uh, sorry, six different regions uh, under the normal case of 40% resistance, and the worst case, 100% resistance. And I don't, I'm not showing you these numbers because I want you to sort of remember 3.41, etc. in this region. I'm showing you these because they, first of all, suggest that, I mean, it, it won't mean that the world will go under <laughs> if, if, we, if we have increased antibiotic resistance in terms of production. But it also, it will mean that we will in certain parts of the world, lose a fair share of our productive capacity. That's the first thing. The second thing I why I wanted to show you this is that if you, you see numbers in media, for example, about climate change, you will see that these numbers would be roughly the same as the cost of climate change. So if we estimate sort of the economic cost of antibiotic resistance, and if we estimate the cost of uh, climate change, not climate change, but global warming, they would be roughly of the same magnitude. That's all I'm going to say about economic cost, actually. So that's all sort of the, all, these are the only numbers that you will see from me, uh, which might be a surprise. <laughs> 